Hello everyone, and welcome to this introduction module to the Procedural Asset Production Masterclass. In this video, I would like to talk about Houdini's geometry and how we can work with attributes and how those attributes relate to the geometry. So to get started, let me first explain the concept of geometry in Houdini and how we can interact with it. So here I have my whiteboard. And what I would like to draw first is a simple set of polygons. So let me just quickly draw a diamond shape. And let's divide this down the middle so we have a polygon consisting out of two triangles. So this would be, in general, in 3D context, uh, a regular type of polygon. Uh, and then next to that, maybe we can also have a curve, which would be a polyline over here on the left. So when we're talking about geometry in Houdini, Houdini's geometry is consisting out of four types of elements. And the first element I would like to talk about are the primitives. Most elements in Houdini, no matter if it's a polygon, a NURBS object, um, a 3D volume, such as a VDB volume, or even a packed piece of geometry, which is sort of a zipped form of geometry, they all have primitives. They actually all have all the elements present in Houdini at all times, except that some of them are used in a different way for these various types of uh, geometry. Right now, I'm going to focus mainly on polygons. Now in Houdini, every single element has a number. So in this case, these primitives would have primitive numbers. So let's say this left one here has primitive number zero and the right face here has primitive number one. If this curve is part of the same data in a node, it would maybe have primitive number two. If it was a separate element, it would start at zero as well. Now next, um, we have points and points are generally located on the corners of primitive faces. So let's add one to every single corner. And points have basic um, coordinates that we can access, such as the point coordinate. But points can also exist potentially in the middle of an edge. So if this polygon wasn't a three-sided polygon, but a four-sided polygon, we could also have a point over here, for example. And if this polyline on this side had a point here, it could also have three points. So this is one primitive, primitive two, which has three points. And these points, just like our primitives, also have numbers. So we could number them. This will be point zero. Here we have point one, two, three, four and again if this geometry is combined in the same node we continue numbering them this would be five six and then seven okay so that's cool um, one other thing we can do is let's say that this particular line this um, poly line as it's called let's write that down as well this will be a curve or polyline, depending on if we're dealing with a NURBS curve or a polygon curve. And this here on the right would be a uh, primitive surface. Okay, so let's say this curve here on the left is actually consisting out of two primitives. In that case, let's say that this instead of having three points, would have two points each. So we can actually add another primitive here, cut it in two, at which point this point here would be the corner of both primitive two and primitive three. Still with me? Okay. So the next element on geometry that I want to discuss is the vertex element. And the vertex element is a bit more obscure you normally don't see them or work with them unless you're dealing with 
um, say, UVs, but they exist on the corners of each primitive. So this primitive would have one here at point one and at point two. And then this primitive would have one at point zero, two, three, and at four. And for this line, I believe they will be located here, 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 and here. And this allows us to assign coordinates to these um, primitives. And this works with how primitives also carry uh, attributes. So we have the primitive attribute, the point attribute, and then we have the vertex attribute. So each one of these geometry contexts can hold some form of information. And then lastly, we have one type of attribute that is global, but is more linked to the entire geometry set on a node, like all the information that's carried by a node. And that would be the detail attribute. This isn't directly related to the geometry, but it's more like a global carrier of attribute information for all the geometry currently stored in memory in a node. Okay, still with me? All right. So next, I would like to discuss the basics of attributes. Um, so we have attributes for every one of these elements. And the first one, and the most common one, that comes with every single piece of geometry, at least, at least with polygons and, say, NURBS, is the point uh, position. So point position is a point attribute, so it's one of the red ones, and it's located on every point. So this is basically the coordinate location um, of this point in 3D space. Then next there are also other attributes that we can find on our geometry. For example, by default, um, surface primitives will already have a normal facing up based on the upward side of that face, right? So if a face is drawn, the order in which it's drawn, clockwise or counterclockwise, will determine if the face points upwards or downwards. And this will result in um, a primitive normal. But by default, these normals are hidden inside our geometry. But we have ways to expose them or to transfer them and load them onto other elements when we make them visible. So let's say by default, these primitives here have an upward facing normal pointing up. And these would be, if we read them out as attributes, called the primitive normal. But we can also read them out on our points, in which case they would be point normals. And then they would be located here. So I'm not going to draw this everywhere, but basically they would look somewhat like this. Oops, sorry, point. Okay. We can actually have more than one attribute on various elements at the same time. So we can technically have a primitive normal and a point normal existing on our geometry at the same time, except that Houdini has some trouble as to choosing which one goes over which. In general, the order is um, point, then vertex, and then primitive when it comes to how Houdini prefers these elements. But, um, well, we'll talk about that more in a moment. Now, lastly, there's one other type of coordinate on our geometry that I want to talk about, and that is the UVW coordinate. And the UVW coordinate is basically any location on a primitive object it isn't directly bound to 3D space. It doesn't matter how this primitive is shaped. It simply just describes the location on a primitive related to its various vertices. So you could consider it as a triangulation of the various vertices on this geometry and where exactly this point is located between them. And this allows us to, say, pinpoint the exact location on this surface and store it as a coordinate. So when we read out our primitive number, we can then get a, a UVW coordinate and from that retrieve a point coordinate. 
there's a lot of stuff to process here. I'm not going to go too much deeper into this right now, but let's go into Houdini and have a closer look at the geometry itself and how we can actually read out these attributes. So over here in Houdini, let's go ahead and create a basic polygon grid. Let's drop down a grid here in our scene. And this gives us a basic polygon type grid. I'm going to stick the polygons for now. And let's give this a smaller subdivision, such as three rows and three columns for starters. Then next over here on the right in the display options bar, we have several markers we can turn on. And the first one I would like to show you is the primitive numbers. So here we can see that every single um, polygon here is its own primitive. And polygons in Houdini are defined, like I said, as a surface or a face that has multiple points. So here, if we click on this button, we get the point markers and they also have point numbers. So that's very similar to what we had in our, uh, in our little example over here. The next, we can also expose some of the normals on these elements. So it says the um, default primitive normal that comes with the surface because right now it's facing upwards. So that would be the um, upward primitive normal. And then we have the point or in this case, the vertex normals, because we don't actually have point normals on this geometry. So let's have a closer look at the actual attributes currently present on this geometry. If I hover over my grid and I click on the info panel, then by default, you see that we only have one attribute currently exposed, and that is the point attribute. And the point attribute is the, 3D is the point in 3D space for every one of these uh, points here. If we want to expose the um, primitive or vertex or point normals, for example, we would have to create a normal node. And this will pull the normal from the internal data of this polygon and bring it into an attribute form. So if I want to expose this normal as say a point attribute as a point normal, you see that now the um, vertex normals have disappeared and start showing as point normals. But if I now look on the info panel of this normal node, you can see that we now have an additional point normal assigned to our geometry. Now, if we want to read out the values of our point attributes, we can also do this by right clicking on our node over here and click on the spreadsheet option. And this will open up the spreadsheet. And the spreadsheet in Odini allows us to see all the various attributes present on the various elements of our geometry. So in this case, we are looking at the point attributes. And you can see that we currently have our point positions exposed at the PX, PY and PZ positions. These are the um, coordinates in 3D space for our points. And then we also have our normals over here as the NX, NY and NZ coordinates. And the fact that Houdini refers to them as X, Y and Z uh, just relates to the direction in 3D space in this case. If we look over here in the corner, we can see our world space axes. And that's basically the direction that we're talking about. So the Y coordinate by default in Houdini is the uh, vertical or upward coordinate. And then we have the X and Z coordinate pointing to the right and the forward direction. You can also see that here in the middle in the global uh, coordinate widget. All right, so now let's mess with some of this geometry and let's create a mountain node. I'm going to drag this normal down and drop down a mountain node in front of it. And the moment I plug this in and maybe increase its intensity a little bit, you can see that Houdini's values start to change. Uh, specifically, the normals start pointing more towards, well, whatever direction this geometry is currently facing. And over here we have our point y-coordinate also updating. 
So all this information is live and being read out from our geometry, right? So that's pretty straightforward. Now before I continue, I just want to show you that this spreadsheet that I pulled up from our normal node um, doesn't actually update the moment we start adding other nodes to our network. If I'm going to make modifications to this geometry, so let's say if I create a transform node behind this and I start to change the world position of this um, piece of geometry, it won't actually change the values on this spreadsheet. And that's because I created this spreadsheet from the normal node. So this one's directly bound to this part of the network. If I right click on my transform node and I open up its spreadsheet, I will open up a second spreadsheet that will actually update if I go and transform this uh, piece of geometry. So how do we actually see our spreadsheet for whatever node we are currently rendering? Well, we can do that by looking at the geometry spreadsheet up at the top of the screen. And this one should be open by default. If we click on that and we start to modify these values, no matter what node I'm currently rendering, it will update to that particular node. But I would like to see it at the same time. So I'm gonna go to my scene view and let's click on the arrow on the right of our pane and then split this pane top to bottom. And then I can simply grab my spreadsheet up top here and drag it down to our bottom pane. So now I have it exposed. And next I would just like to show you um, some of the other types of attributes that we can set, right? So here we have all these kinds of point attributes. We have the point position, we have the normal, and if I were to add a color node as well, So like so, we would also add a point color, which I can change, of course. And in this case, the point color directly corresponds to the RGB of our color. So uh, red, green, and blue. So if I set it to a dark red, the point color would become 0 0.5, 0, 0 0.0 for green, and 0, 0.0 for blue. Let's set this to a more easy to watch color like orange. Um, and then we have our primitive attributes. So if I were to create a separate color node and go over here and change it to the primitive type, then now I'm actually watching primitive colors. And you can see how when I click on the other color node, my point color has disappeared, but it's actually appeared here over on the right under the primitives tab. And primitive color, if exposed in our viewport, is unique to every single primitive. So let's switch this color scheme over to random. And now you can see that every single primitive, based on its primitive number, is being assigned a random color. And it's visualized for every single face. If I were to do this for the point color, on the other hand, I set it to random as well, then you can see that the point color blends between the different points and it creates a much more gradient-like style. So that's an important thing to note, is that point color and vertex color act differently. Uh, point values or point attributes will always average out, even if they are the same attribute, whereas primitive values will be solid and be limited to just that primitive. Now next up we also have our vertex coordinates or vertice attributes. And these are default attributes that are present on our geometry. So to expose those we can press the D key in our view screen and then under the markers tab we have our various elements that we can expose uh, including vertex markers. And these will now highlight the vertices on our geometry. If I switch to vertex selection up here, I can now select them. And as you can see, every single primitive surface has a vertice in one of its corners. The coordinates of these vertices are stored in our vertice attributes. So these relate to the 
primitive that they're currently a part of. So if I just make this a little bigger, you can see that we have 0, dot 0, and this is at point 0. So that would be this vertice. Then we have um, this vertice here, which is part of primitive 0. It's vertice 1, and it's located at point 1. Uh, 0, 2 is located at point 4, and 0, 3 is located at point 3. If we just look closely enough. So this is how vertices in Houdini um, show you where they're located. Next, let's have a quick look at UVs. Let's grab a UV texture node. And this node allows us to apply a texture to our geometry. Now by default, since we don't have a material applied, we won't see the texture. But you can see that this node has generated a couple of UV coordinates for our shape here. Now there are various ways we can UV our geometry in Houdini uh, in a procedural way. But I'm not going to go over that right now, but we will cover that in the introduction assignment. So. Don't worry, we'll get to that. So if we want to view our UVs, basically using a default texture, we can place down a quick shade node. And the quick shade node simply applies a texture to it. We can load the texture from our hard drive, but by default it will load this, uh, well, this default checker box texture. And now you can see that we have our UVs. So this relates to the UV coordinate space. If I go to my perspective view and I switch to the UV viewport, then you can see that our entire mesh has now been laid out on top of our 0 to 1 space. So that relates directly to the 0 to 1 coordinates that we can find down here in the uh, <coughs> vertex coordinates. Now we can store UV coordinates on points as well. It will work if we do that in Udemy. Uh, if I change the attribute class for vertices to points, it will still work. If I look under the point attributes, you can now see it's located here. But this can cause a little bit of problems when you want to separate your UVs between two different um, primitives. So uh, let's avoid doing that. Normally I think having vertex UV coordinates is the best, of course. And then lastly, we have our detail attributes. And like I mentioned, um, detail attributes are shared over the entire geometry. All the geometry stored on this node would have a detail attribute. And we can explore some of those if we look at the intrinsic attributes. And these are the hidden attributes, the information that this node carries. If I click on, for example, the bounds over here, we can see that Houdini already has some attributes that come with our geometry. These are the bounding box coordinates, basically describing the total bounding box of this object. And some nodes in Houdini, like the bounding box node, um, bound, as it's called, will actually use these coordinates to create a basic bounding box for this object. Let's not get too far into this, but intrinsic coordinates can be read out using a variety of script commands. They aren't easily accessible, but they're available to us, such as the point count, um, how many point groups or which point groups are present on our geometry. Uh, we can even read out the memory usage of this geometry. So there's a lot of information about this geometry that's actually hidden to us, but we can also access using the detail attributes. Okay, moving on, let's have a closer look at what happens when we want to change one attribute to another. And we can do this using a node called attribute promote. And the attribute promote node allows us to change, say for example, our primitive color to a vertex color. So over here, we right now have our primitive color present. And let's say I want to promote this to a vertex attribute. Well, up top here in the attribute promote, I can find the original name parameter. And here on the right, I have a drop down for all the parameters currently available to us. Now, right now, it's looking for a point attribute. So let's change the original class 
to a primitive attribute. Now if I click on this drop down, we will see the color attribute appear. If I click on this, then now it will basically transfer the point color from our faces to all the attached points on this geometry. Now this is going to give us the same result as when we simply applied a point color over on this side. Um, instead, let me change this to vertex. And when we do this, just like our UVs, now each single vertex has its own color and it will properly keep that color in this position, no matter what the shape of our geometry or our point connections actually are. Now, so far, we've been working with Houdini's basic default attributes, such as the color attribute and the normal attribute. But what if we actually want to create our own attributes, store our own kind of data on our geometry? Well, we can do that by creating an attribute create node, for example. This is one of the more straightforward method of creating attributes on our geometry. If I press tab and I type um, attrib, we will get a large list of attribute related nodes that we can use to change attributes on our geometry. But the one that I'm currently looking for is the attribute create. So let's place one down and hook it up. And the first thing you'll notice over here on the spreadsheet is that now we have an attribute one value being added with a default value of 0.0. .0. And this corresponds directly to the attribute that we have up here in our parameter panel. Um, we can change this to any other class, so any other element type. Um, we can change this to primitive attributes as well. So now it's moved from our points to our primitives over here. Um, but let's change it back to the points. Next to that, we can also change it to a variety of different other types, such as integers. Uh, we can change them into a vector. We can load it as a text string or a variety of arrays. We'll have a closer look at this in a second. Um, but next, we can also look at, um, say, the size of this attribute. If I increase the size of the attribute, we actually increase the amount of entries present in this. Um, just to make the distinction, this isn't an array, but Houdini does treat it like you know, multiple values under the same attribute. Uh, let's not go too far into that right now. And then furthermore, we can set the values for this attribute. So uh, if we're dealing with a size one um, float in this case, then only the first value here will actually do something. Let's set this to a value of five. Now, as you can see, our attribute over here has taken up the value 5.0 because it's a float. Now, let's give this attribute a more custom name. So let's go over to the name field and change this to um, my float. And now you can see that in the spreadsheet, my attribute one value has changed to uh, my float to match the name. Next, I would like to view it in my viewport so I can see it on my geometry. This is uh, very much like how we can currently see our point numbers right now. To do this, we need to create a custom marker. If we press D inside of our viewport here, we will open up the display options. And from there, if we go over to visualize, we can start adding our own markers so we can view them on our geometry in our scene view. Next, we need to decide where we want to store this marker. Um, by default, it's going to be saved to our scene, but if we were to save this under the common visualizer and then save that out, we can have it available to us in every one of our Houdini scenes, uh, in all of our Houdini sessions as well. So this can be useful if you um, want to reuse one of your more custom markers more often. In this case, I want to create a marker called my float, so I'm just going to type this in here. And the first two values here relate to the name that we see in the interface. But the actual attribute we're looking for is down here. So if we type the name of my float down here, now we can see it's appeared on my screen. We can also um, specify 
the specific class for this attribute. If we don't want it to automatically try to associate it, we can assign it specifically to the point class. Next, we can also set when this um, marker will be visible. We can, for example, say that it's only visible when it's near our mouse pointer. So if we go ahead and hover our mouse over these points when we're in point selection mode, um, the attribute will appear. Or maybe if we set it to only our selection, so we only have them visible when we have our geometry selected. In general, I tend to keep this as always visible uh, unless I need it otherwise. We can also set the color, of course. So maybe we can make this a more easy to read color, like maybe bright green. And then we can set the size of these markers as well. So we have these attributes visible. Let's go ahead and see what happens when we assign it only to a part of our geometry. So up top here in the attribute create, we have the group field. And the group field allows us to assign, uh, in this case, our attributes to specific parts of our geometry. So let's say I only want to assign it to um, points 0 through 4. To do that, I can type 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and this would select those specific points. But right now, it's actually trying to look at the primitive groups. So we need to actually also specify it here as points, like so. And as you can see now, the um, attributes have changed. So the 5 value is only present on the first couple of points here. And down here in our list, we can see that only the first five values, only the first five points, have the value five assigned to them. So this group up here is filtering to which points this attribute is being assigned. If we want to do this a little bit easier, we can also type 0-4, and this will select the entire range, just like typing every single number. And we can combine this and there's multiple different ways to um, select and unselect numbers using this format. We'll talk about that in the next video. Um, now next to this, you can also see that the other values down here are automatically set to zero. And that's because these weren't assigned. Now when we create an attribute, the attribute actually has a default value. And right now, for my float, this value is 0. So if I want to give this a different value, I can simply set a different default value, say, let's say, to 2. And now all the values that I'm not actually assigning the value 5 to will have a default value of 2 instead. So over here on my spreadsheet, you can see that the unassigned variables um, are set to 2. Now to finish off, let's go ahead and add two more attributes to our piece of geometry. First, I would like to generate an integer that matches the same numbers. And then let's create a string that's on a different uh, point set. So the first one is simple. If we want to add a new um, attribute to the same set of points, we can simply add it to our attribute create over here. If we add a new attribute to this list by clicking on the plus icon or typing in 2, then we can scroll down and find over here a new attribute, just like in our, um, <coughs> in our spreadsheet. And let's call this one my integer, my int. Let's set its type to integer. And for its values, I'm going to set this to tree and then to 2. So this value now has a assigned value of 3, and whenever it's not assigned, it's going to be 2. If I want to visualize this in my screen, I can of course create a new marker through the D menu, but we can also do this slightly quicker by hovering over the node that has the attribute and clicking on the info panel. And then we can click on the attribute that we want to assign as a marker. If we do this, then it will add it to our marker list. If we press the D button again, here you can see we now have 
a marker generated. Now by default, it will actually default to a color type. Um, let's change this to a standard marker right here. And this will immediately show us that we have it visible in our screen. So this means that we don't have to go ahead and type in the attributes in all these fields. It's a slightly faster way to set one up for yourself. So let's go ahead and give this a different color. Let's make it yellow, for example. So that's an easy way to just add more attributes and visualize them. But what if we want to create a string attribute that is on a different set of points? Well, in that case, we need to create another node that generates it because we cannot assign it because of this group uh, set up here. This attribute create can only assign our points to its current selected group. So let's go ahead and create a new attribute create node and hook this up below. And in here, I'm going to call this um, my string. I'm going to set this to a string type. And then we can type in here, of course, the value of this attribute. So let's call this, say, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. OK, so now that's appeared. And now, if I want to assign um, this to a particular group, I can, of course, type it into this field. But what I can also do is click on the arrow here on the right. And if I do this and I select, say, a certain set of points, I can then right click and click accept selection. And this is a way to, in a more manually um, defined way, create a certain point selection. Or in case we want to set it to primitives, let's change it to a primitive attribute, Um, a primitive selection. So I'm going to remove this selection, grab our selector here, and now I can use the shift key to add to my selection, and then I can click accept. And now I've added my attribute to these primitives. Now once again, I'd like to visualize this attribute. So I'm going to go to the info panel, and here now we can find my string as a primitive attribute on our geometry. Let's click this. And by default, um, string values can't be assigned as a color, so they should automatically appear as uh, markers instead. All right, so at this point, we've pretty much covered all the basics of attributes and how they relate to geometry in Houdini. Um, if you want to continue watching a bit more about attribute nodes, I have one more video lined up which will explore some of the more common or useful attribute nodes in Houdini. But if you just want to continue on to the next topic, which is going to be groups, then you continue on to that video. Now in the group video, we're going to explore how groups are used to make selections on nodes so we can mask their operations. And this is useful because, as you saw, we can do this and it allows us to activate attributes, for example, on specific parts of our geometry. So if you're interested in that, then Go ahead and continue on to that video, and I'll see you next time. Have a good one.